Uh, my name is Chelsea Turner. I'm the director of the Responsible Gambling at the Massachusetts Council on Compulsive Gambling. This is our first Take a Break with Game Sense uh, speaking series that we're going to be holding weekly um, at 11.30 on Wednesday afternoons. Our first presenter today is a, a young gentleman named David Tang, who works at Encore Boston Harbor Casino and is going to be talking to us a little bit about gambling myths. Um, hope you enjoy the presentation. He's done a tremendous amount of work, uh, along with some of his colleagues also helped on this project. Um, but we hope that you enjoy it and uh, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end um, of the session. So, um, so please sit back and enjoy and hopefully learn something new. Thank you, everyone. Here you go, David. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chelsea. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to do this presentation for you all today. Hopefully you all get something out of it. I will try to slow down a little bit because I've been told that I do tend to go a little fast. But if there's anything throughout the presentation that you didn't catch, feel free to write it down or jot a note and I'd be happy to repeat it or answer any questions that you have at the end. Um, other than that, I just want to say thank you to everyone that helped me make this presentation. A lot of work and time and effort did go into this project to make sure that you know it's up to uh, the standard that we want. And with that being said, let's just dive right in. So first and foremost, throughout this presentation, we have a few goals. We want to really discuss some of the uh, myths surrounding the gambling industry, specifically in the casinos. So first, we want to cover why do people believe in myths? Okay, what's, what's some of the psychological basis behind why people start developing myths and start perpetuating them? Then we're going to talk about three common myths that are in the casino environment. And last but not least, we're also going to talk about how to dispel these myths and foster more of a responsible gambling culture. So, so some of the psychological basis behind these myths, okay? Well, first off, human beings are not perfect, right? Millions of years of evolution have shaped our brains and we have certain biases. Whether we're aware of these or not, everybody has these regardless of their upbringing, culture, intelligence, okay? First, I wanna talk about the information bias. So a lot of people have this desire for more information and this is more true than ever given the age that we live in with you know, Google at our fingertips, Siri at our fingertips, and just practically limitless information on the internet. However, the thing is, more information does not always serve us better. There comes a point at which more information actually hinders our decision-making ability, and yet people still crave even more information, even if it's not relevant. The next bias is the negativity bias, and this is when a human being remembers a particularly painful event over what would be the actual the statistical average. So an example of this is remembering losses over wins, right? The exact opposite of this is the optimism bias. So this might be a, a person that hasn't experienced a lot of losses. They're overestimating their favorable outcome because that's the outcome that they perceive is most beneficial to them. So that's the one they're hyper-focused on. The next one is neglect of probability. And I can't tell you how shocking this one is, but essentially the human brain is just not calibrated to handle thinking of statistics, right? Uh, it's actually relatively recently that we actually invented the idea of statistics. It came out probably, uh, I want to say, just a little over 100 years ago. And even experts neglect to really take into account how probability affects things. So more into that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, there's also the alternative facts bias. And this goes into the latter part where we talk about how to dispel these myths. Once somebody has an established belief, there has been a wealth of studies done that show that you need a, an even greater amount of evidence to convince somebody of something that goes against their belief than if they already believe it. And that might seem intuitive to some, but what it essentially boils down to is that people do not want to believe information that goes against their beliefs, even if that information might seem beneficial to them. And last but not least, is the illusory truth effect, okay? This is people's tendency to believe false information after repeated exposure. Because we are social creatures, we look towards social cues from our environment. So when everybody surrounding you believes something, people in that environment will start believing it too, even if initially they may believe that information to be false. So here's a quick clip from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air just illustrating how Anybody can be affected regardless of intelligence level. Oh, let's. Quarters. 
right half quarter square. Wait, see, I know I can beat it. Oh, see, listen, first, first it was Bell, Bell, Cherry. Right. And then Cherry, Lemon, Lemon. Oh. But now it's just Cherry, Cherry, Bell. Cherry, Cherry, Bell. Cherry, Cherry, Bell. Cherry, Cherry, Bell. Get a grip on yourself, man. Look, I got the money for the car. We can leave. Come on. I can't. It's this damn thing. It just... So really quickly from that clip, you can see that Carlton has fallen in for the uh, information bias as well as the neglect for probabilities, where typically he's a pretty smart character for any of you that have watched the show, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. You know that Carlton is someone that typically thinks with his head, and he, out of anyone, should understand that probabilities are against him in any casino game. And yet we find tons of people in the casino all the time, regardless of education or background, that fall victim to this trap. Now, another common myth, uh, this perpetuates itself a lot on blackjack tables, is that people often believe that the third place player, the third place player uh, and the first base player over here in these two spots are somehow responsible for how the rest of the game goes. So if the person in first base does not take the card they're supposed to, if the, or the person in third base takes the card they're not supposed to, if they make any action that goes against basic strategy, other players at the table might sometimes believe that they've essentially ruined the shoe, okay? And the rest of the shoe is not going to go well. And you see a lot of quote unquote veteran players or experienced gamblers get really upset over this. So it's a really interesting phenomenon that it only really happens to more experienced blackjack players. All right, now of course we know this isn't true. You know, unless you know all of the cards in the shoe as well as the order they're going to come out in, the person in first or third place really has no way of influencing the rest of the game. 50% of the time they're going to make a wrong move that's going to benefit the table and the other 50% of the time they're going to make a wrong move that's going to hurt the table. So it, overall it makes no difference has no bearing on the outcome of the game. Now, another common one is regarding player cards. All right. A lot of people believe that uh, when you insert a player's card or a, a loyalty or rewards card into a slot machine, that the casino now has eyes on you, that they are able to influence when the machine is going to pay out or hit a jackpot, and that they are able to change the payout for the machine over the cameras, essentially. All right. So you see a lot of people, regardless of their player rank or the amount of money they, they spend, really leaving or buying into this myth. Now, we all know that this is not how casinos operate, and this is not how it works. Uh, you know, the random number generator is completely separate from the player reward system. However, it takes once people have been exposed to this information again and again and again, and they hear it from all of the people around them, they hear it from their friends, from their family members, they hear it from strangers, it's going to take a lot of work on our part to try to dispel that myth once it's been established. All right. Now, this is probably the most common one uh, that people think about. It's often referred to as the gambler's fallacy or the Monte Carlo effect, where people will see hot streaks or they'll see cold streaks. So they'll think this deal is going to bring me luck or I'm wearing my favorite shirt right now or, you know, today's my birthday, so I'm going to be extra lucky. Whatever the case may be, people try to find any source of control, any information that's going to give them an edge. Now, this is not how casino games work. And interestingly enough, okay, there is a betting strategy called, uh, I believe it's the Monte Carlo strategy where you bet on the opposite color. So let's say, for example, you can see in the picture that 19 has come out a bunch of times. It's all red numbers, right? So if a bunch of red numbers come, you know, people intuitively think, well, I think a black number should come next. And that's not how these games work. The odds stay the same every single spin. Right? And there have been people who have fallen you know, victim to this uh, in the Monte Carlo Casino in 1914, where a roulette dealer rolled 24 black numbers in a row right now that's not the record in the u.s 
in the 1940s, there was another casino and another roulette dealer who rolled 32 red numbers in a row. All right, to explain to you how rare that occurrence is, the odds of it happening are less than one in 10 billion. And you have no way of predicting when events that's infinitesimally likely to happen will happen, right? So all the players at that table lost money. <clears throat> Right. And this is a quick clip just showing how gambling gets portrayed in our culture and how people can kind of get their perception of gambling shaped by some movies in popular culture. Hey guys, did you find it? Nope. But check this out. Jolly, 10,000. Hey, uh, this is taken. Feel free. All right, let's play the play. So anybody that's, that knows a little bit about math knows that blackjack and that is not such a simple game where you could read a book and suddenly become a blackjack professional or just win you know, piles of money. However, often it's portrayed that way in popular culture and a lot of people come in with these false perceptions. You know, logically they may know that's not likely, but they have this subconscious bias towards wanting to be that lucky player, wanting to beat the system or finding some way around things, right? So that's just something we need to keep in mind when people uh, do come from casino environment, that that is the norm. That is part of the expectation that you can maybe somehow game or beat the system, right? So when it comes to dispelling this, there's a few things we need to consider. First and foremost, right, is that we need to build rapport with anybody before we can communicate anything to them, right? There's a saying, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So that's the first thing we need to do. The first step is to show them that we care, that we have uh, you know, a stake in their well-being, basically. We invite them to speak because communication needs to be uh, a two-way street. We can't simply be talking at them because that's going to be the least effective way to get uh, to reach any type of common ground or to create any type of change, right? So other more basic tips that we have are to mirror body language and to mirror speech. Everybody has different speech patterns. They have different ways of communicating and when we begin to mirror their speech patterns, we begin to mirror their body language. Now we're communicating to them in their language. And finally, probably the most important thing is to listen attentively. We don't know exactly where they're coming from, what their mindset is. Right? We don't know what their attitudes are towards gambling, or whether it's you know responsible or irresponsible, whether they have you know compulsive gambling tendencies. Right? We don't have access to any of that information until they volunteer and give it to us. So listening is even more crucial than what we actually say. Now, a few of the things I also want to bring up are, uh, this is called the rhetorical triangle. You see over there to the right, we have four Greek words, pathos, egos, logos, and kairos, okay? This is often referred to as the rhetorical triangle by Aristotle. And this was uh, basically his method of persuading someone. And I just want to translate and uh, go over what each of these means. So the first one, pathos, means emotion. So it's an emotional appeal, an appeal to someone's emotions. Ethos is someone's character, their reputation, how reputable the speaker is, how trustworthy their words are. 
And the third one is logos, which is logic. And the reason why I put this here and present this to you guys is that this triangle contains the three main elements that we need in order to convince someone or to persuade them. And logic is only one of them. Yet far too often, we have people that focus on the logic because we're presented with the facts, we're presented with the information. And sometimes we just think, well, if all we do is we just give them this information, we give them these facts, they've got to understand where we're coming from. Sad to say, that's not how human beings work, okay? And everybody should keep in the back of their mind that logic is only one corner of that rhetorical triangle. And then last but not least, I stuck Kairos in here. It's often brought up with the rhetorical triangle because there's a timing for everything. You never know when someone is going to be receptive, okay? If they only have two minutes to get out of the casino or they've got an appointment coming up, they got to go pick up their child, they might not be in the right frame of mind to necessarily hear you out, no matter how beneficial your information may be, no matter how much they may like you, it might not be the right time. So it is more important that we connect with them, even if we lose the battle. Let's say, for example, we don't convince them today. However, we build that connection we're going to win the war, all right? So the final thing is just simply to know your audience, all right? Know what they're there for. What is it that they're open to hearing? And they may not be open to you right then and there. They may not be open to you today. But if we build that connection, we build that rapport, that day is going to come. Now, I included a quote here by Charles Kettering because I absolutely love this quote. Okay, and it goes like this. Knowing is not understanding. There's a great difference between knowing and understanding. You can know a lot about something and not really understand it. Right. And that's the, the frame of mind that a lot of people have in the casino. They feel like they know things. Right. And sometimes we feel like we know things, but understanding is what's crucially important. And you cannot you, you can tell somebody a piece of information and now they know it. But for them to understand that information, they have to come to it at their own, on their own terms, on their own time. Okay. So a few tips I have to try to speed that up a little bit, right, is to make sure that we don't we don't step on their toes while we're doing this. So invite them to share what they learned, but at the same time, don't make it personal, right? We don't want them to think that we think of them as a compulsive gambler because they may not be, all right? And even if they are, they may not be comfortable yet thinking of themselves like that, all right? So invite them to share, hey, do you see how this could benefit anyone that you know? Or do you see other people that think the same way? And do you see why we're here talking about it, right? And then see how it's gonna apply to their life. If you think that it might have sparked some type of change in them, ask them, okay? Do you think this is going to affect how you plan your future casino visits? Um, do you think that you are going to change the way you play at the tables now? Right? So those are two things that we got to keep in the back of our minds. Now, you see, I have this little meter here at the bottom, right? And so often in any people facing job where we're dealing with the public, it can be really easy to get frustrated. We all have our good and our bad days right? Um, and uh, that's, that's simply inevitable. But just remember that the public needs us at our best all the time, right? Even if we're not feeling it 100% of the time, okay? The actions that we show um, kind of set the basis and the groundwork for our reputation, right? So we want to be personable all the time. We want to be compassionate. We also want to be confident. We really have to own this knowledge if we want to transmit it to anybody else. If we're uncertain about the things that we're talking about, how can anybody put any stock in what we say or put any trust or faith in our words? And last but not least, we need to be persistent, okay? Because this is not a battle that's won in one day, right? And for every person that we convince, there's going to be 10 more out there that still have the wrong frame of mind or they have a different way of thinking. And we just have to be persistent so that we can reach these people. All right. And that's all I have for today. Folks, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to hear them now. Anybody? Let's just wait one more second, David, and see if we have any questions or if anything's coming 
Coming in, anybody? All right. Well, thank you very much, David. Really, really appreciate the time that you put into this. Um, I know I certainly learned something from this and hopefully everybody else that's listening in did as well. Uh, we're looking for, oh, we got a we question. Got yeah, uh, it's in the chat. Bruce Stebbins asked, does the opening of casinos change your approach? And I think that's an excellent question. Um, I, I think that really there's a casino culture uh, that's inherent in every single casino. There's there's certain overlaps, there's common ground no matter where you go. However, each casino has its own uh, set of patrons. It has its own player base, and that that brings a certain personality to the casino. So it takes a little bit of time to get to know everyone, but I, I don't I don't think that the overall approach changes as long as we're going at it with an open mindset and we're really listening to people. We can we can pretty much talk to anyone regardless of their background. I think that's an excellent question. All right, anybody else? Hey, David, this is Mark Vanderland. And, um, so the, one, fantastic job. I love how you uh, you bring kind of the psychology, um, your, your background in psychology to the presentation. Um, it's fantastic. Um, how is it different working with casino employees compared to working with patrons? Is there is there a different way that you need to talk with them? Um, are there biases that you think are more common and deep seated with casino employees than with patrons? Yes, Mark, I think that's an excellent question. And uh, generally, I want to say that casino employees fall in one of two categories, right? There's the set of casino employees that really believe that they know the games so darn well that they're the expert and they don't need to hear anything from anyone and it doesn't matter what you have to say they already know it uh these these people are an absolute joy to deal with all right ask any game sense advisor <laughs> all right uh however however that doesn't change our approach okay if if they have uh let's say as long as they're open to listening to us, as long as we know that they're open to communication, right? We're still going to try to instill responsible gambling into them. And whether they take it or not, right? At least they know where we stand and that we're acting with honesty and integrity and that we're acting in a way that we believe is right, right? all the time and they get that itch and so we've had conversations with casino employees where they talk to us about David, you know, the gambling issues so, david sorry to interrupt but i think uh you faded out on a bunch of us for anybody uh -huh. that doesn't need video right now, including myself. If you guys could turn that off to help with the connection speed. David, if you could just restart that answer, that'd be helpful. You, you started okay. by, by the last I heard was honesty and, te and integrity, operating with honesty and integrity. And um, in terms of your conversations with approaching the casino staff. Okay, all right, perfect. So uh, I'm saying the second set of employees that we have to deal with are the ones that are open to learning something new because they're the first to admit hey we may not necessarily know everything about the subject and we would be you know glad to get any more information that would be helpful uh so these are the people that want to know more and are probably the easiest to talk to of casino I people uh, developing really you know self-destructive gambling habits or at the summit and find themselves entirely truth regarding these stats 
and I, I honestly find that really easy to connect with them, right? To them, have for them. However, the connection is still more important than the actual information, and that may seem kind of counterintuitive, but it, it's it's really I, I found that if you give people the time and attention that they want, right, they're ten times more receptive to any information that you may have. All right, does that kind of answer that question? It was still a little bit choppy, David. I think we're having a little bit yeah, of. Yeah, um, that's 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 great. Thank you very much. Issues, but yeah. So, thank you everybody for joining us. On uh, it, it was perfectly clear to, to me. Oh, was? Great. Yeah. In that case, is there, are there any that's other good. questions? I'm glad to hear. Uh, I've got one from Ray Fluet. So Ray asked, "How is your approach to a guest that totally believes they're in?" And I think that's a fantastic, fantastic question because you know what? Uh, that can seem like such a difficult situation to deal with, all right? But in reality, it's not, okay? We already know where this is going to go. We have to stand firm in our knowledge. We can't give way. Now, we're not going to start arguing with them, right? We want them on our side. We want to build the connection. Like I said, the connection is first and foremost, right? So we're going to ask them a little bit and I'm going to say, hey, uh, you know, Maybe we start talking about the games that they play. So what do you normally play when you go to the casino? And they start telling us about the slot machine. They start telling us about how when they insert that player card, they just don't win as much. And, you know, the first time I came in, I put that player card in. I won a lot. But now I think the casino is watching me. They're tweaking it. And you know what? Here's the thing, okay? They're going to continue believing that until we can persuade them otherwise. And that's the thing. We have to keep moving towards that goal inch by inch, even if they're fighting us the entire way, okay? So what might happen is the first time they say, all right, yeah, I don't believe you, all right? The second time they say, oh, you told me that last time. The third time they might say, well, I did a little research and yeah, those, those, those laws you were talking about, you're right, the casino can't change the payouts, but I still think there's something up about my card. And slowly but surely, we slowly turn that attitude around. Without connection, though, that's impossible, okay? And it doesn't matter how much information you have. doesn't matter what websites, what stats you show them. The first time, you can give them all the information in the world. You can give them an entire encyclopedia's worth. They're just not going to believe you. It takes time, and it takes connection in order to really turn that guest around, right? And we just have to handle it in a, you know, a delicate, uh, delicate way. All right. And uh, anybody else? Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you, especially to Mark Vander Linden, Teresa Fiore, um, Marlene Warner, uh, for helping to provide a lot of feedback on this presentation in advance, as well as uh, other folks from the Encore Boston Harbor Game Sense team um, that worked with David on this presentation. Uh, we're looking forward to continuing this series two weeks from now, uh, same time, 1130 on Wednesday. Um, and where uh, we have a, a lot of topics and a lot of information we want to share. Our problem right now is just picking which one uh, we're going to showcase next. So stay tuned. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day. David, great job. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you for your time, folks, and take care.